we learned about batch normalization very early in the semester. There are other types of normalizations that you're going to hear about. So why am I putting group normalization here as the last slide for a video? The problem with batch normalization is that, yes, it is really powerful and it's going to give you a state-of-the-art results for as long as your batch size is reasonable, at least 32 images. You're processing 32 images at a time. But then when you go to problems such as object detection, segmentation, or when you go to videos, usually your batch size is around two. You cannot process more than two videos. It's not going to fit on your GPU. Your batch size is small, either because it doesn't fit on your GPU or because it's a choice that you make. If you remember, when we were doing object detection, we were processing two images at a time, but in each image, you have multiple bounding blocks. Uh, proposal, proposed regions. It was our choice, but sometimes it is not our choice. We are limited by the constraint of the memory in our GPU, etc. So sometimes your batch size is going to be small. For instance, when we were doing object detection, we were doing transfer learning. We trained our network on ImageNet. Uh, we had the batch norm on, so it was training. Those gammas and sigmas, they shift and scale in your batch norm. We were training them. But then when you were doing transfer learning to your object detection, you were fixing those parameters. You were freezing them when you were doing transfer learning. So those two parameters are not gonna be learned anymore. Why? Because your batch sizes are small, because your data set is smaller, et cetera. So you were freezing those parameters and there is no reason that those shift and scale that you learned on ImageNet is gonna be the correct ones for Pascal VOC or Microsoft Coco. Okay, it would be good to have a normalization method that's batch independent. Those statistics that you are obtained are independent of your batches. So group normalization is one such method. What is the effect? If you have 32 batches, 32 images, per each worker, it could be per each uh, GPU. So each worker here is a GPU. If you have 32 for your batch size, you're getting very good uh, error rates, and this is for ImageNet. And this is just an experiment to show what happens as you decrease your batch size. And let's track the blue curve. If you use 16 for your batch size, you're still not bad, but as, as you go to lower batch sizes or smaller batch sizes, your error rate is gonna go up significantly. Okay, if you process two images per GPU, then in the end, your error rate is around 35% compared to 24%. But then group normalization is not that sensitive to the batch size. And, uh, but if your batch is big enough, batch normalization is still better than group normalization. But what is this group normalization? And how does it compare to the rest of the normalizations that exist in the literature? This is a very good plot. Each image is going to have a height and a width dimension that's our Z axis in this plot. It's gonna have a C dimension, a channel, and it's gonna have a batch dimension. What batch normalization does, it's gonna compute the averages, the statistics, mean and standard deviation by looping over the batch dimension and the height and width dimension, so the resolution. So I noticed that some of you are using batch sizes to be one and you were not running into trouble in your code it's because there is still a height and a width dimension that you are computing your statistics by. Otherwise, the variance of, if you didn't have this height and width, the variance of a single batch is gonna be zero and you're dividing by zero in your batch normalization and you would run into a, a lot of trouble. So yes, you can have batch size of one for images if you have a third dimension, the height and width and the width. So that's batch normalization. There is layer normalization this one is not gonna be sensitive to your batch size because you are computing your statistics across the channel dimension and the height and the width dimension. You compute the statistics and then you divide, you subtract the mean from each pixel in this image and then uh, divide by the standard deviation. That's gonna be layer normalization, but layer normalization is not gonna give you good performance for images. It is usually used for recurrent neural networks. 
there is instant normalization. This is when your statistics are coming from batch size being one, so from one instance. This is exactly what, the, what I just described here. Because you have a third dimension, the height and the width, the dimension of the pixels, you can compute your mean and a standard deviation. Without this height and width, you are into trouble. And what is group normalization? It's something between, and actually before I go there, the applications of instant normalization is for generative adversarial neural networks. We are probably going to cover them in the next semester. So that's a technique for GANs. And then there is group normalization. It is something between layer norm and instance norm. You create a bunch of groups per your channel dimension. For instance, in this case, you have two groups, and each one has three members per the channel dimension. And then you compute your statistics here. That's group, like, group normalization. And it seems to be effective, but let's go through batch normalization and try to remember it, at least from the math perspective. I'm going to go through it really fast because these we cover. You want to normalize your xi, your input. So you're going to subtract the mean and you're going to divide by the standard deviation. And this is going to happen regardless of the method. This is your normalization scheme. X is your feature. What is i? i is a multi-dimensional index, and it's going to index the n dimension, the batch dimension. It's going to index the channel dimension. It's going to index height and the width. And n is your batch axis, c is the channel axis, h is the height axis, and w is the width axis. So you have multiple axes here. You compute the mean and a standard deviation for all of these methods. You compute the mean over a subset of these points per each pixel, and you compute the standard deviation. The only difference between these methods is SI, okay? And SI is a set of pixels that you use to compute your mean and a standard deviation. And what is M? M is the size of SI. M is the size of this set. So what is SI for batch normalization? Your K, it's the set of all of the Ks, and your K is going to be a similar vector to I, to your index. It's going to have Kn, Kc, Kh, Kw, and then you're fixing the Kc dimension. Kc should be equal to Ic, and the rest of them are free. So given Ic, you can compute this uh, Si set, and that's going to give you your batch norm. What does this mean? You're computing your statistics, mean and sigma, over all of the other dimensions other than C. You're computing along N, H, and W. So that's exactly what is being denoted here. In this case, IC was one, but your IC could be this is slice. And then you're doing your statistics. You're computing your statistics on this index. So that's batch norm. Layer norm, the set is different. SI is going to be different. Now you're fixing your IN dimension. It's better to think of it this way, that now you're computing your statistics over the channel dimension and the height and the width dimension. So these two dimensions, these three dimensions. For instance norm, you're fixing two indices, and then you're computing your statistics on the rest. So you're computing your statistics over your pixels only. And then for all of these methods, including group normalization, you're going to do a shift and a scale. These are going to be some additional parameters, gamma and beta. And these are per uh, channel. So these are vector that have the dimension of your channel, have the channel dimension. And we know why we add them, because after you subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation, uh, then everything is going to be mean zero, and they're going to have a standard deviation of one. So you want to add some parameters to be learned. For group norm, your SI is going to change. You fix the batch dimension, so you are not doing any statistics along your batch dimension. But then you're turning your KC and IC, and you're doing it per group. G is going to be the number of groups that you have. For instance, it could be 32 groups. In our case, it was two groups. C over G is going to give you the number of channels per group. In this case, you have three channels per group, and you have two groups. And this is just telling you that I'm doing my summation over all of KCs that satisfy this property that are within my groups. And it's better to think about it this way, that you're doing your summation over the height and the width dimension, as well as a group of C over G channel, a group of three channels. 
in the example above. How do you code it in TensorFlow? You can have a similar code in PyTorch or MXNet or Chainer, etc. You need to give it the gamma and beta. These are the shift and scale. Epsilon is just a small number because we don't want to divide by zero. And uh, you compute your mean and variance. You're going to use the moments command, and then you're going to tell it which dimensions you're computing those statistics from. And you reshape it and then multiply gamma and add beta. So that's how you're going to implement that. And it's just a matter of reshaping your input. Basically, you're dividing your channel dimension, and then uh, you're dividing it into a G and C divided by G. So you're adding one dimension to your tensor. And then you do your averaging over this dimension, C over G, H, and W. And then you reshape it back. So what is the effect? If you apply it on ImageNet, this is bash norm, this is layer norm, this is instance norm, this is group norm, and each one of them is going to lose some accuracy for you. It's going to give you a higher error. Instance norm is the worst. Layer norm is still not that great, but group norm is not losing that much. It's losing only 0.5%. Uh, but as you change your batch size from 32 to 16 to 8, then you're going to see the advantage from group norm for smaller batches. You can apply to detection and segmentation. So that was a classification task. This is a detection and segmentation. Now the cool thing is that for Coco, you can let this beta and gamma be learned from Coco dataset. Previously, if you were using batch norm, you had to fix, you had to freeze gamma and beta. Now you can let them be learned, and then you can apply that to video dataset. And it's a video classification task and kinetics data. And then you can process smaller number of clips per GPU. If you use batch norm, you're going to have a significant drop in your performance. But if you use group norm for these small clip sizes, these are basically your bag sizes, these two curves are on top of each other, more or less. And the variations that you're seeing is because of noise in the train. Any questions? So we learned two powerful techniques today. One was the non-local operations, non-local blocks. And the other one is that it's not always the case that batch norm is the best method. That's going to depend on your network and your batch sizes. If your batch sizes are small and you're dealing with images and your task is probably detection, segmentation, or video, perhaps going with group norm is a better choice compared to batch norm. And just to, I guess, maybe clarify, Batch norm will all, or sorry, uh, larger batches are always advantageous just because it uh, allows more parallelization so you can speed up training. Is that correct? Yes. As long as you can fit them on your GPU. Yeah. Or TPU, yes. Okay. Because you can parallelize them and process them. You can do data parallelism. That's one reason. The other reason is uh, probably the gradient estimate that you're going to get is going to be more accurate. But at the same time, it's a trade-off. It's always a trade-off. If your batch size is too big, you're reducing a lot of the noise. And we know that these noises are usually useful for your neural network to regularize. Because it's not always the case that you want to push your loss function to its global minima. You want to find good local minima. That's going to help your network generalize on your test data. And usually the noise, the regularization that's introduced because of the noise in your batches and in your gradients, they are helpful. But sometimes they can hurt. If the batch size is very small, they can start to hurt. And this can happen because of your video. Your videos are going to be a bunch of uh, images. And we know that that's just more memory because these are bigger, they consume bigger chunks of your memory per each data point. Maybe the entire data set is smaller, but each data point is heavy in terms of its memory consumption. So next session, we are going to do 3D data. These are going to be point cloud data. And usually point clouds, are, they don't have any structure. So far, our data has a structure. There's a batch dimension, a channel dimension, height and width dimension, and we can put them uh, on a grid. The point cloud, they're not going to have any grid. It's just going to be a set of a bunch of points in your space. And I think with that, I'm going to finish today's session. I'm going to be around if you have questions. And once you want to leave, you can leave.